maybe I, I, I could at first explain what my disposition here is uh, according to the, uh, you have my notes possibly or, or the outline. Uh, this is four part presentation. The first part explains why the Protestant reformers emphasized the role of education, which is the, the main thing. And another part uh, explains the core reform reasons for emphasizing the importance of mass education, especially the reformed reasons, but we could say uh, as well the Protestant, general Protestant reasons, but, but uh, I take these reformed uh, theologian, protest, uh, reformed uh, reformers uh, as an example. The third part consists of the connection between the Protestant missionary impulse and this education uh, question. They are also uh, very internally related. And the fourth path, uh, I, I will uh, discuss a couple of things about the emphasis on mass education. And then we will have some uh, discussions, uh, questions. But why the Protestant reformers emphasized the role of education? Uh, I guess the first and foundational fact and the most natural fact uh, or, or the reason is that the Reformation was an academic movement uh, from the beginning. The major reformers, they were uh, academicians, they were theologians, uh, they were university men. Uh, even John Calvin, uh, who wasn't formally uh, teaching at university, uh, he was also a man of letters. He uh, understood constitutional law and so forth, in addition to theological uh, studies which he had and so forth. But the Reformation was an academic movement, and of course, all those who have their positions uh, in the academy, they understand what is the uh, role of education for any purposes, but especially for, for this uh, Protestant Reformation. So the reformers were academic scholars, men of letters, uh, Martin Luther in Germany, Philip Melanchthon, uh, who is really the father of, of the Lutheran theology, Philip Melanchthon. Uh, Martin Luther was a kind of a prophet, he proclaimed and and, and he gave the basic ideas, and Philip Melanchthon formulated those theological ideas into a coherent theological position. And that's why he is called the father of Lutheran uh, theology. Uh, Philip Melanchthon uh, was the theologian and the evangelical uh, theologian. He wrote the first systematic theology of evangelical Protestantism in 1521. Uh, and which was also the first Lutheran dogmatics. But he was called, in a Latin term, uh, Preceptor Germaniae, which is the teacher of Germany. And uh, we can see from the beginning that the teaching uh, element was very uh, at the core of this whole project of Protestant Re uh, Reformation. He was the teacher of Germany. Then, for example, uh, Mikhail Agricola, who was the reformer of Finland, he was uh, a pupil of Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon especially, he studied under Melanchthon, and he brought this Melanchthonian Lutheran Evangelical Reformation to Finland. And he emphasized the Bible, he translated the Bible into Finnish language uh, and other uh, literary works. Uh, but he also uh, emphasized the general education. He brought with him uh, the collected works of Aristotle from, 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 from Erfurt. And, and from, uh, from Germany where he studied. Uh, and he uh, was of the opinion that in addition to the Bible, uh, Christians should understand the uh, other humanities as well. Because God's general revelation and special revelation, they stick together and we should understand the whole picture by uh, being knowledgeable on, on that topic and that topic and, and so forth. Uh, Martin Luther in, in Germany, he emphasized popular teachings uh, teaching, he said that, uh, well, he, he wrote about 400 books, uh, very uh, immense literary achievement, although some books were quite small by today's standards, but he, he wrote over 400 books, but he said that uh, if all his books were going to be destroyed, uh, preserve uh, two books. Another was the, the Bondage of the Will, where he explained his uh, theology of sovereign grace, and uh, another book was his small, small catechism, which was the popular teaching tool uh, to teach uh, uh, people what the evangelical uh, 
doctrine is and what the Bible basically says. That's what Luther Small Catechism is all about. But we can see here that uh, he very much emphasized education also uh, on this uh, regard. Uh, John Calvin, uh, in addition to biblical theological occupations, he was an academic specialist. As I said, in constitutional law, he was one of the top European specialists on this topic at that time. And therefore, in Geneva, they asked his advice on, on these so-called secular questions as well, because he was a specialist in, in these uh, law uh, questions. But especially, John Calvin was a biblical theologian and, and emphasized the role of, of, of uh, educating lay people, uh, the so-called common Christians, uh, in understanding what the Bible really says. And, and he concentrated on, on this uh, very much. Uh, another thing to uh, reckon with is uh, that the reformers emphasized the importance of universities and their uh, curriculums. Uh, the basic reason was that the uh, Protestant Reformation needed a trained clergy, uh, a very well-trained clergyman. That, that was the basic ideal. To be a Protestant pastor was not only to be a person who performs some religious rites uh, in the front of, of, of the congregation, but who understands what he is saying, who understands what the Bible is saying, uh, what is the evangelical theology and so forth, and is able to teach this to the congregation. This was the very uh, heavy emphasis uh, uh, in the thinking of all uh, reformers, we would say. And um, the, uh, the fruit of this thinking uh, or one example of those fruits was the Genevan Academy, which started in 1558 in, in Geneva, and it was officially opened 1559. And the Academy, uh, which uh, Calvin, Calvin thought that that's, that's very important to have an Academy in Geneva for this uh, educational uh, purpose, uh, it featured two levels of curricula, a theological seminary for training ministers, which was the, the main reason for this academy uh, originally, uh, and then a school for the public education of Geneva's youth. It was seen that we have to train, educate our youth. Uh, without this, the whole reformation is not going to uh, proceed. Uh, both educational curriculas were tuition free. They were supported by many French immigrants in Geneva. Uh, and these French immigrants in Geneva, which was an independent city-state, they were the most ardent supporters of Calvin and his uh, reformational program. And they also uh, supported these educational uh, efforts. Uh, other faculties, such as law and medicine, were added later. But this uh, Academy of Geneva became the international standard bearer for full-blown education in all major fields of study. So it was kind of an embodiment of the basic idea that uh, in order to spread uh, reformed thought, evangelical thought, we need uh, very uh, well-funded and, and uh, top-level in institutions which are able to educate our youth and our ministers and our congregations. Uh, I can give uh, for you a couple of quotations from uh, this book, uh, John Calvin, Pilgrim and Patriot, written by W. Robert Godfrey, uh, uh, a very famous uh, Presbyterian church historian. And this book written or published 2009 by Crossway. This is one of the most useful uh, small uh, and, and short introductions to the uh, thinking of John Calvin and his theology and his uh, uh, and his, uh, in his biography. And if you would like to understand what this uh, reform theology, what, uh, what this uh, form of Protestantism is all about, you, you should read this, this book. This is very, very well a uh, short introduction. Of course, there are many other good books on this topic, but this is one of the best. Uh, on the pages 44 to 45, uh, Godfrey writes as follows. Uh, Calvin admired uh, a butcher, uh, Martin Butcher, 
it, it's pronounced, I guess, Butzer in, in old German, Martin Butzer, who was the reformer of Strasbourg, the father of the reformed church in Germany, um, who, uh, whose pupil John Calvin at first was. But anyway, Calvin admired Butzer and the reformed church of Strasbourg greatly and learned a great deal from his experience there. Butcher had four offices in the church, pastor, doctor, elder, and deacon. Calvin later introduced those four offices to the Church of Geneva when he returned. Calvin also followed the order of worship that he learned in Strasbourg, although refining it somewhat. Now, this is important. He was also impressed with the approach to education that he observed there. Uh, Strasbourg can be seen as the mother of reformed Christian education. A great educator, Johannes Sturm, worked with Butcher and the city council to establish a school system to educate citizens and to begin the education of ministers. Uh, Calvin based much of the schooling that he later introduced in Geneva on what he had learned in Strasbourg. Now, end of quote. Uh, now we can see that uh, from the beginning uh, there were two uh, streams, two strains uh, to educate citizens generally and especially to educate uh, ministers and, and pastors. These two uh, were seen very uh, important. And then uh, on the pages 66 to 67, Godfrey writes as follows. Uh, and this is very important quote because uh, it uh, shows us the connection between preaching and education. This, this is very important, especially for Calvin, but, but for all reformers. Uh, and as we understand that uh, preaching is the, the very core of Protestant service and, and, and the, the, the basic element of what the church is all about. Uh, we have, uh, or, or through preaching God, uh, Holy Spirit works uh, his work of grace uh, and gets people saved. And that's why preaching is very important and the office of a preacher or a pastor, which according to Protestant view is an office for preaching, is very important. Uh, but this book says as follows, Calvin was highly regarded as a preacher in his own day. While his sermons were clear and simple, they were also pointed and vivid. His vividness did not arise from clever stories or illustrations, rather it was expressed in his use of forceful verbs and metaphors with the aim of communicating effectively. This is important, communicating effectively. As he said, seeing the office of a good and faithful shepherd is not barely to expound the scripture showing what it teaches, but he must indeed use earnestness there and sharpness to give force and power to the word of God. For Calvin, preaching was at the center of the work of a pastor and required that the minister be thoroughly educated in the biblical languages of Greek and Hebrew and in theology. Preaching is the way in which God speaks to his people and therefore must be done with the greatest care and uh, faithfulness. When I expound the Holy Scripture, I must always make this my rule, that those who hear me may receive profit from the teaching I put forward and be edified unto salvation. If I have not that affectation, if I do not procure the edification of those who hear me, I am a sacrilege profaning God's word. Edification is central to proper preaching, for God will have his people edified when we come together in the name of God. It is not to hear merry songs and to be fed with wind that is vain and unprofitable curiosity, but to receive spiritual nourishment. And of course, in order for this to realize, uh, the preacher must understand what he's talking about and communicate effectively uh, to the congregation, which in turn may also understand what the preacher is saying. And therefore we can understand that ministers needed education and also congregation, uh, the citizens, the basic common Christians needed good education. And then uh, on the pages 135 and 36, uh, Godfrey uh, gives us this kind of summary, and this is uh, very important. Uh, Calvin ultimately realized his goal of establishing in Geneva schools that offered education at all levels and met the diverse needs of the city, the church, and individual citizens. 
Calvin's most basic concern was for the education of ministers to serve the church. Already in the draft uh, ecclesiastical articles of 1541, Calvin writes of four orders in the church. Calvin is following the teaching of Martin Butcher and the practice of the Reformed Church in Strasbourg. Uh, chapter 5 of this study examined Calvin's thought about ministers, elders and deacons. The fourth office, doctors or teachers, relates particularly to the schools. Of these doctors, Calvin writes, the office proper to doctors is the instruction of the faithful in true doctrine in order that the purity of the gospel be not corrupted either by ignorance or by evil opinions. So to use a more intelligible word, we will call this the order of the schools. You see, this uh, uh, component of education uh, belong to the essence of Calvin's view of the church as well. In, in, in church uh, organization and, and how to understand the, the, the concept of office. The fourth part of the office was, was uh, uh, the, the office of a teacher and, and uh, office of a doctor, which was very important for the stated uh, reason. He expressed a desire that the school at the level of ministerial education have a doctor of Old Testament and another of New Testament to lecture in theology. Calvin recognized that such ministerial education had to build on basic university studies. But because it's only possible to profit from such lectures in theology if first one is instructed in the languages and humanities, and also because it is necessary to raise offspring for time to come, in order not to leave the church deserted to our children, a college should be instituted for instructing children to prepare them for the ministry as well as for civil government. The state, as well as the church, needed educated citizens. And there are these two elements again. In turn, university studies uh, rested on earlier education beginning around age seven. While the structure of the levels of education basically follows the pattern traditional in the Middle Ages, the curriculum and goals of education were greatly revised under the influence of the Renaissance and Reformation. Reformation goals aimed at teaching as many as possible in society to read so that they could know the Bible. Renaissance curriculum stressed the importance of clear thinking and writing as well as the skill for the careful reading of the text. The early years of the curriculum of the Genevan schools focused on reading, writing and the study of French, Latin and Greek. The education in Geneva was decidedly uh, confessional. That's also an important thing. What is the content of what you are teaching? whether it's so-called secular or, or whatever, or, or whether it's confessionally Christian or confessionally evangelical even. And then the great aim of all this education was, first, an educated laity to read and understand the Bible, and second, an educated ministry. Those who graduated from the Academy of Geneva to become ministers often joked that their diploma was their death certificate, because so many would become first preachers and then martyrs in France. In time, the reformed schools in Geneva and elsewhere in Europe would achieve their educational goals. Literacy would become widespread in reformed countries, and a remarkable body of well-educated ministers would serve the churches, and so forth. But I think uh, this uh, gives well the general picture of what, why the reformers supported education, why it was seemed important, and why it was so effective also in Europe at that time. And the second part, the core reform reasons for emphasizing the importance of mass education. Point A, the scriptural principle. The, uh, all, all, the, the foundation for all of that, which we read from that uh, book previously, uh, is the Protestant scriptural principle, the Protestant doctrine of authority. Uh, and this is a distinction uh, to the former Roman Catholic basic understanding what Christianity is all about. Uh, Protestant Reformation uh, posited uh, the point that uh, all theology and uh, doctrine and evangelical doctrine should be based on God's words because it only had God's authority behind it, the Bible, the scriptures, the God's written special revelation. When it comes to theology, doctrine, and so forth, the Bible had the sole and the highest authority 
uh, there is, the scriptural uh, principle. And this was the first basic reason why this education, education question became so important for, for the reformers, because it follows directly from this understanding of uh, what the authority is, what, what is the highest authority in theological questions. If we don't have this kind of a biblical or scriptural principle, as the Protestant theology has, then uh, the connection with education as such is going to be weakened. But uh, because there was so heavy an emphasis on, on, on written special revelation of God, that's why the reformers had to emphasize also the role of education. Another uh, basic theological reason, the core reason for emphasizing the importance of uh, education, as, and especially mass education, is that uh, according to Reformed doctrine and Protestant doctrine in general, God speaks through spoken and written word. That's, that's the very important thing. Uh, the written revelation of God is the basic means God the Holy Spirit uses in regenerating and in sanctifying and doing his work of sovereign grace. God's work is mediated uh, but it's not mediated through the hierarchy of the church, as in the standard Roman Catholic understanding, but it's mediated through the word, especially, and which is the business of the preachers to, to uh, proclaim the word. Ministers, ministerial education, and the office of a minister or a doctor or a teacher is very important because the function is to proclaim God's word, which is the main sacrament, we could say so, according to Reformed theology. Uh, God's word is the sacrament and the means of grace as a medium of the Holy Spirit. Uh, John Calvin uh, had a very sacramental understanding of what the word of God is, and that's why he had a very sacramental understanding what preaching is all about. It is not just proclaiming some facts or, or some you know, impressions and, and, and so forth, but it's the, the medium God the Holy Spirit uh, uses in his work. Uh, and in this word also, Calvin thought, taught that uh, the risen Christ who is in heaven now, uh, he, is, he is present uh, through the Holy Spirit, but Christ is really present with us, but in his word and, and, and through the preached word on the basis of, of, of the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why uh, the right understanding of, of what the word says and the ability to understand what is being preached are, are very uh, important uh, points and functions which uh, must function well in order that evangelical faith may proceed and, and uh, may prevail. The third point was, was and is, still is, the importance of personal biblical faith. Uh, this was a major component of evangelical preaching and teaching. Uh, to have faith in Jesus Christ is it, it, a very personal uh, thing and in order to personally trust the promises of grace and have faith in Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, personal individual understanding was of, of major importance. Uh, these are the basic theological reasons stemming from the scriptural principle and, and the basic understanding of uh, what are the means of grace. Uh, Calvin and the Reformed theologians and other Protestant theologians, they emphasized also the sacraments of baptism and Lord's Supper as a, as a signs and seals of the covenant of grace. But even when it comes to these material sacraments, the core of them is also the word of God. So we don't, don't have any ki kind of special sacramental grace in addition to the sacramental grace connected with the word, the preached word of God. So again, we can state that the preached word or the word of God read by an individual, that's the major means of grace. And, and that's, that's why uh, education uh, was very necessary and was seen to be a very necessary uh, thing to, to uh, uh, advance. Uh, the point B in this second part is the importance of the ability to read and understand the text. And as I, read, uh, as I said, uh, the congregation was supposed to understand, not just watch 
and, and, and get some impressions, but also understand. And this was based on the fact that a uh, human being was seen as uh, uh, forming a unity. Uh, your heart and mind and, and feelings and will, they form a unity. But uh, anyway, we have also to understand things. Uh, and that's why uh, we had to read and understand the text. And that's why the general Protestant practice became uh, that uh, the congregants, the, those uh, Christians who became to the service, they brought Bibles with them. That was something new uh, and different uh, compared to the, the earlier times. Uh, for example, if you compare the practices of, of, of medieval times, uh, the Bible was not so prominent back then. But the uh, Evangelical Reformation emphasized the importance of the Bible so that uh, it was basically supposed that when you, are, when you go to the service regularly, uh, you bring the Bible with you and then you can read the text the preacher, pastor is reading and then you try to follow what he is going to proclaim and then your understanding is growing and your spirituality is going, uh, growing. That was the basic idea, but uh, you couldn't do this if, if people couldn't read or understand or, or, or so forth. And that's why education, even mass education, public education, uh, was uh, very much uh, emphasized. And this was based on another uh, essential Protestant reform doctrine, uh, the priesthood of all believers. Now, uh, evangelical Protestantism uh, didn't understand the, the office of a preacher to be a separate uh, order or, or a hierarchical order, church order, but it, it was the office for proclaiming the word of God. Uh, all believers were priests in the spiritual sense. And that's why they had also responsibility to, by themselves, understand and believe personally in, in Jesus Christ. And if this was achieved, on the written revelation of God, then of course we understand that the question of literacy and understanding hermeneutics, how to understand text, all these questions rose to very high importance. The need for a personal ability to understand, that was very uh, important. And the need for hermeneutical tools uh, also. And that's why these academies, colleges, schools, uh, public schools back then uh, gave these abilities uh, to people. The third major point in this whole discussion is the Protestant missionary uh, impulse. Uh, now, as we know from the church history, um, the modern missionary movement, of which the, the whole evangelical movement is a part, uh, it was a very Protestant uh, phenomenon, and, and, and it was a very reformed phenomenon even. Uh, for example, we remember William Carey, who, who started from England and went to India and so forth. His very reformed understanding was, was the basic inspiration for him to go to some place where Christianity exist, didn't exist at all. And he thought that, well, Christ has his elect also in India, in, in, in that pagan land, and he's going there. And he was one of those major uh, missionary um, uh, personalities and, and, and theologians and one of uh, the basic functionaries of the missionary movement. But uh, all is based on Christ's uh, great commission. And let's read what Christ uh, said in his uh, great commission in, in, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28 and verses uh, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always until the end of the world. Uh, amen. Uh, there are many key words in this great commission. At first, Christ states that all power is given unto me, this is his kingly mandate. He, he is now a risen king. He sits on his throne and he orders his church to go forth and to do what? To proclaim the gospel at first, but then to teach. Again, we are dealing with education. Uh, then 
this sacramental uh, element is mentioned, baptizing, but then again, teaching them to observe all things. This teaching component is very predominant, predominant in this uh, uh, great commission. And then a point uh, to observe is that uh, this great commission is given uh, in order to Christianize, to evangelize, but eventually Christianize uh, all nations. It doesn't say that teach and evangelize individuals here and there, but uh, evangelize and teach all nations. And of course, we understand that nations are based on uh, organic connections, families, tribes, languages, as the Bible uses these terms. And then finally, uh, nations. But this means that the gospel and everything related to it uh, must be uh, taught to whole nations. And we can understand that uh, the concept of public education is, uh, or, or is linked very much with this whole concept of, of the Great Commission. Uh, make disciples of all the nations. Entire nations are to be by the power of God's word and of the Holy Spirit. And according to the sovereign will of the ascended Jesus Christ, converted and Christianized. Uh, this task may seem somewhat utopian to our natural eyes, but we have always to understand that uh, we have the kingly backing for this great commission. What seems impossible uh, to us is not impossible to God. And that's why we can understand that both preaching and teaching and, and educating, uh, they are not worthless <coughs> tasks because Christ has commanded those tasks. And that's why uh, we have to do them and, and emphasize them. And this is the basic understanding what the reformers uh, uh, had. Uh, and especially this all uh, was understood in the context of Reformed Covenant theology. Uh, both Christian families and Christian nations should be taught. Uh, Reformed Covenant theology, the federal theology, gave the theological components uh, for this procedure. Uh, and uh, that's why, especially that's why the Reformed theologians emphasized uh, the, the aspect of education even more. Uh, so it's very important uh, to connect education uh, to both home, congregational, and communal public uh, spheres. Uh, that's also the reason why uh, vernacular Bible translations were important. And that, in order to translate Bible into vernacular, vernacular languages, national languages, that demanded uh, education and skills, uh, linguistic skills, and so forth. And again, why the Bible was to be translated in order that whoever, whatever nation or tribe or, or, or language group you belong, you are able to read God's word in your own tongue. Uh, well, this is something which, uh, you know, is connected to the uh, Acts chapter 2 at, at, at the happenings of Pentecost also. Everyone heard the gospel of Christ in his own, in her own tongue. And that's why the Bible translations were very important. And the, the fourth point, the emphasis on mass education, uh, is based on all this, what we have uh, uh, seen here. Uh, one uh, technical uh, tool to advance this mass education uh, during the 16th century and forwards was, was the printing technology. Now, the reformers found it very useful to apply the new technology of book and pamphlet printing in the service of the Reformation. And that's what we have to use today. We have a different kind of technological devices today, uh, digital and so forth, and we have to use them to further the gospel and educate and, 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 and uh, bring the truth of Christ to everyone. Uh, it was urgent that as many people as possible could read and understand the evangelical message of the Reformation. That's why uh, technology, education, and all these tools were to be employed. And that's why the reformers supported public and mass education, as was exemplified by the Genevan Academy. And the more 
the literacy of the population expanded, the more was felt the need for mass media. As we can understand, that this is a natural outgrowth of this uh, basic uh, development. Uh, then there was also another reason uh, which we can uh, uh, define as follows, fostering of classical republican civil virtues. The reformers understood that the, the general population uh, must be virtuous population, if possible, it must be Christian population, believe in Jesus Christ and so forth, but it must be educated in virtue also. That, that was the uh, basic connection. And uh, the reformers and Protestants generally, and the reformed especially, uh, felt because of this reason, educational responsibility for the whole people. And the reformed emphasis on representative republican political vision and the democratic liberty fostered by it led naturally to the following consideration. Uh, democracy is not just about majorities and voting rights. But the main point is the quality of citizens and general population. In order to vote and represent properly and responsibly, one must be educated and able to understand the issues, both theological issues and social issues and, and so forth, and ethically. The public needs education, we could say, in classical republican and Christian civil virtues. Now, the reformers understood that the so-called classical republican civil uh, virtues were very much the same as the classic Christian virtues in, in general. Uh, and so uh, the mass education the and the institutions for mass education uh, were supported and emphasized for this very reason in, in order to achieve uh, that kind of uh, uh, end result.